So, hello and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of literature everywhere. Today, we're talking to Jane Labus. Jane is an award-winning journalist known for her coverage of international human rights issues. Her novel, Past Participle, was long-listed for the Bath Novel Award 2022 and published on the 20th September 2023 by Afsana Press. Hello Jane, welcome to Story Radio. Hello, thank you for having me. Past Participle is set partly in a contemporary Senegal. Is it a place you know well? Yes, I have strong connections with a village called Angor, which used to be outside the main city of Dakar, but now it's more or less a suburb. I first found my way there in 1997 as a young student, and over the years I was in and out of there a lot. I worked and lived there, so it's a very sort of deep-rooted personal and professional connection that I have to the place. What were you studying? So I studied French and English, and then we were offered as part of our French degree a year abroad, but because I'm part French, I'd spent a lot of time in France already, so my mother actually found a scheme run by the British Council offering teaching positions for students. So I applied and I got it, and it turned out to be one of those very life-forming experiences. The first time I'd lived away from home, the first time that I'd lived abroad, and it was when I first went to Senegal, it was such a culture shock. And then I think it sort of rooted in my heart. It, it you know, good and bad, you know, I loved it, I hated it. And I just formed a very deep connection with the place. I ended up going back again and again. I met my ex-husband there and we had a daughter who's half Senegalese. So I had a very varied experience because I've been an expat there. I've worked there as a journalist, but I've also obviously got enormous family connections there. And so I've had this very interesting experience of being a foreigner, but also in a family context. And for me, Ngor is, you know, sometimes my ex-husband has said, you know, it's your village. And I do feel that I feel it's it's very a powerful connection. And, And when I go back there, you know, people know who I am and it's if it kind of feels strangely like home and it is very much that place it is very much Angor it's it's all about the sea it's a place where pe- you know everyone loves surfing and fishing and swimming Angor people are very very good swimmers I love swimming in the sea a lot of Senegal isn't like that you know you, you could go into Dakar in one of the more urban areas of Dakar and that it's it's a completely different culture so for me, Angor was the place where I wanted to set past participle. It felt like that was the right setting for this book and the right setting for Lily as a character. Could you give us a, a little plot summary for our listeners, just to tell them a little bit more about the book and its setting? So yes, past participle is the story of a Senegalese lawyer who decides to investigate her brother's death three decades before in Dakar at the hands of the British diplomat's wife. So essentially, it's it's a dual narrative told by Lily Tunkara, who is the Senegalese lawyer, and Vivian Hughes, who is the British diplomat's wife. And it sort of leads you through Lily investigating that crime and the two women meet, but obviously everything is not as it seems. And so it's also about their relationship and how they go from essentially being at odds and enemies to this strange sort of friendship of two women who are from completely different worlds and the strands of the past and life that connects them. Great, thank you. Vivian's narrative is set in mostly in Britain in the 1980s and then the source of the medical trial in Senegal, which must have taken quite a bit of research. How did you approach that? Yeah, so it's sort of two strands. So... I think for me, Vivienne, first of all, when I started developing the book, I wanted to explore Vivienne's character as the diplomat's wife. And I I know from the beginning, I didn't want her to be your standard diplomat's wife, as it were, who, you know, a cliche sort of woman. I wanted her to have something different about her, which was how that idea of the memoir came about, because I wanted to tell this story Initially, you perceive her as Lily does, as this very sort of 
rather arrogant white woman, very privileged, lots of money, had this marriage and, and lived abroad, that kind of thing. But I wanted to show that actually, again, all was not as it seemed and where she came from was completely different and how she got into that life was completely different. And then as I was writing it, I, I'm assuming that most writers do this, I, I wasn't entirely sure what happened and the the idea of the medical um, crime came about as I explored um, Vivienne's character. So it, it sort of hit me, I think, you know, I was a few chapters in writing Vivienne and sort of finding my way through as I, I, I think, you know, a first draft is often about telling yourself the story, isn't it? So that's what I was doing. I was in Vivienne's head and going through, wondering what she was doing and following what she was doing. And, and then as I do, I go away and think about it slept on it and had a little bit of a light bulb moment and thought, oh yeah, I, I think I know what I'm doing here. And then obviously after that, that was when I went and researched um, medical scandals relating to African populations. And there was this one very renowned case. It was a big pharmaceutical company. The Pfizer one. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah, who did the trials on during a meningitis epidemic. And so it was, it was based on that. And I didn't, you know, I didn't want to dwell on the technicalities of that. I didn't want to sort of go into sort of the pain of those children or anything like that. What well, that's not what the book was about. But I, I used that as the, as the premise for what happened in in the novel. I'm trying trying not to give the plot away. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, Britain in the eighties. Did you have to research that? Or, yeah, you know? I mean, I don't know. I, I was kind of into the whole. I mean, I've lived in London a bit, and you know, worked in and around Soho, and I, I was quite into that. I always feel Soho is quite seventies anyway. It's like <laughs> has mm. that very that feel. So I I kind of I don't know. I sort of felt it. I did. I did research. I, I had a very clear image in my mind, actually, of what Vivienne was like. You know, she was essentially, you know, a, a call girl and, and she'd come upon hard times and she was trying to make life work. And I just had a very clear image of of that and how she met her husband. And, and I, and, you know, I've done a bit of internet dating myself, so I, <laughs> I used that. You know, I don't think it's changed particularly much over two decades, three decades. So, and I, I actually really enjoyed writing her memoir. I I enjoy taking her from uh, the the image of one woman to quite another, and I enjoyed that as a writer. You know, going on that journey with her and sort and, and exploring her personality and and mm. yeah, I found that really enriching, and I. And I felt the book needed that to make her a fully rounded character. Mm. Yeah, because we get Vivian's narrative in three modes, don't we? We get her conversations with Lily, we get her memoir, and we also get her own reminiscences. So it, it kind of gets quite tricky, doesn't it? Kind of uh, delivering a, a narrative in that way, and yeah, which bits of information you supply in which mode. How, how did you approach that? Yes, interesting, because, again, it's strange, isn't it? When you're writing, I don't think you're as aware of what you're doing as when you look back at it. But I think there are three distinct ways that Vivienne tells her story and ways in which she is reliable and unreliable as a narrator. So the first part is, obviously, it's close third person. So she's just going about her life now. And then the memoir is very much she's telling Lily a story, but she is very consciously telling that story to Lily. So she is unreliable, she's omitting things, she's not giving her everything. And then by the end of the book, you come to that quite powerful conversation between the two women in person, which is where Vivienne really drops the act. And that's where, I think for me as the writer, that's when I really started loving Vivienne, because I was like, oh, I actually really like you. <laughs> and until then, you know, she was, the, you know, she's quite cold. She's quite chilly. Um, but I think when she starts to really warm to Lily and that relationship, you see it sort of building. And I think that's when you think, you know, she never had children. And I've always felt that was an element of why she 
likes Lily, why, why she starts to care about her, because she sees in her the daughter she doesn't have. You know, that's sort of the subtext, I think. So, yeah, I, I think there were three distinct ways that she does tell her story. And I think hopefully by the time you get to the end, you see why she's told them in that way, hopefully. The relationship between Vivian and Lily is, as you were saying, it's quite complex and it's a key part of the novel. Can you describe how, how you developed the relationship through the stages of the novel as you were writing? For me, it was almost about taking those characters and bringing them together as in real life. That is, we talk about our process as writers, but for me, it's very much that. I don't necessarily plan everything to the second I know in my head where the story is going to go, but it's not until I get those characters on the page that I know what they're going to do. It is almost like they they take over, and it's difficult to explain that, I guess, but they sometimes go in directions that you didn't expect. And obviously, sometimes you have to edit that back to where you want it to be, but sometimes it's actually where it's meant to go. So I think, for me, the two women, as they meet, as they interact, as they correspond that is how their relationship develops and I loved writing the end of the novel I loved writing those end scenes I didn't know they were going to be like that until I got there and I didn't know how they were going to become so connected and that came about through the book you know through them they have this correspondence and Lily reads her diaries and Lily has revelations of her own and so by the time they come together they're both in this place that the one sort of nourishes the other I think and so that conversation I spent a long time on that and and I actually it sounds a bit crazy but (laughs) I did role play it um, vocally so I sat in my living room (laughs) and I'm so glad no one saw me but I did act out Vivian and I acted out Lily and I I tried to feel what they would feel in that moment so so what they would feel when they were when when they were having that conversation you know I say if they were real to me they are real so you know as real people how would they feel hearing those things and giving that sort of information it was the first time I've I've done that and I found it really useful actually to to just try to delve as deep as I could into the emotional connection that they have that's um, a really interesting technique actually I, I've never mm. I've not done dialogue like that have you ever done it like that Martin I have actually yeah yeah I think yeah sometimes I've had little figures and representing them oh, where they you? are yeah, and you know, moving them around because yes. that could be, yes, the, can be quite significant yes. where they are and what posture they're yes, taking yes the, the kind of things. body language mm. as well yes very and yes I, and I think sometimes when you do role player or use physical objects you you think oh gosh no she wouldn't actually do that she'd do this so yeah I think mm. I, I certainly found it very useful and I would do it again I, it was quite intense I think I think it's useful for those sort of more intense scenes when you also don't want to get into melodrama there's sort of that line isn't there between you know intense and just mm. melodramatic and it's not where you want to go so mm. There's little artists, model figures, you know, oh, they're yeah, quite, yeah. quite good for them. Oh, I might get one. Mm. <laughs> two. Yeah, two. <laughs> Could you tell us about the development of the book? Was there a, a real life inspiration behind your story? Yes, absolutely. So, so there was a case, it was a couple of years ago, probably more quite well known about a boy called Harry Dunn, who was tragically killed when an American diplomat it was at that time uncertain if she was a diplomat or she was the wife of a diplomat. She was coming out of a party one night and she hit Harry's motorbike and he was killed. So that was a a legal case that was going on and the American diplomat, Anne Sekoulas, she fled the UK pleading diplomatic immunity. So there were all the elements of that I found very compelling. I, I remember following it on the news. One the idea that this diplomat's wife had killed a boy, but you didn't hear from her, there was no voice. And secondly, that she fled pleading diplomatic immunity, which I've always found a very interesting concept. 
and I wanted a new idea for a novel. I was intending to write a novel and it was it was kind of a bit miraculous because I sat in the garden, thought to myself, right, I'm going to sketch this out now. And I thought really, really hard for about half an hour and I was just suddenly had it that obviously if you transplanted that scenario to West Africa, to Senegal, then automatically those um, nuances become incredibly complex because if you made the character of the boy into a local Senegalese man or boy and if you had the diplomat's wife who was the one who was accused of killing him then automatically you have some very interesting power dynamics going on and that kind of hit me in a flash and I thought yes I know this is the story I want to write and then in the same thought process I thought yeah I, I want that boy to be called Emma because it's love it's the past participle of to love in French and so the book's going to be called past participle obviously <laughs> and and obviously after that I mean I was very excited about it I think I remember sort of dancing around the garden ringing my family and telling them I had this amazing idea for a novel and then obviously after that came months of work to just it, it was a great initial concept but obviously I needed a story I needed you know, you know it's you need I needed to know what happens in that story so then I, I spent the summer kind of planning that out and sketching that out and and developing those characters but I, I, I know I saw very clearly these two characters of Vivienne the wife and then Lily who I wanted to be that very sort of powerful educated dynamic African woman and sort of reclaiming justice for the past and that was very much what I wanted the theme to be that in the past there had been a lack of accountability you know but Lily was going to go back and 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 make people accountable so for me that was the, the kind of power of the story and where I started as a, a starting point so and I, I was really I was really clear about that. Obviously, you know, then once you get into the story and the characterization, then it it becomes much more. You go into the the details of people's lives, and it becomes more complicated than that. But that was that kind of overarching theme, I think. Thank you. How important was Lily's husband's infidelity as a trigger for the start of her investigation into her brother's death? Yes, I thought that was an interesting question. No one's asked me that before. Very much for Lily, you know, her subplot, her arc for her character is that she goes from being, you know, an unhappy wife, a, a absolutely loving mother who is in a, quite a controlling relationship with this man who is just off doing whatever. And and she she, by the end of the novel, I think, has very much taken control and taken hold of the steering wheel and gone, no, this is not happening. So, and I, and I, I know that point when she sees Demba in the village philandering is very much that kind of inciting in incident. So before that, for the first chapter, she's sort of been umming and ahhing about whether she should take action about Emma's death and sort of she's looked at the case and she's thinking oh I could get in touch with Vivian Hughes but you know maybe I should just let sleeping dogs lie and then when she sees Demba I think to be honest she just thinks oh, you know F it <laughs> I'm just mm. gonna do this you know I I need to make change and it, it's almost she she wants to make change to everything she she wants to get justice and everything is so unjust for her as a woman so she's going to get justice for her, for MA, for everything. She's in that kind of, you know, I've had enough mode and, and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this and I don't care what happens. So yes, I think, I think that is one of the main inciting incidents for Lily, certainly. It's really enjoyable mm -hmm. watching her grow as a character, I have to say, and sort of become more empowered. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, she's a powerful person, but in her personal life, she's, takes a more submissive role, doesn't yes. she? And it's good yes, to completely. see her sort of, you know, become stronger. Yes. 
Could you tell us about your writing process? What stage do you share your work and who do you share it with? Yes, so I normally, I'll think of an idea and I'll, I'll make lots of notes and I'll take some time to just think. Over sort of two months probably, I just have the idea and let it almost boil in my mind. And I always think that's really useful. And jot notes and jot things about characters and scenes and settings. And then I'll write a first draft. And I I don't do a rough draft. I do a first draft and I write as as perfectly as it can be at the time. I don't find it useful to rough it out because I, I'm just so unsatisfied then with it. So I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I found that most useful for me, say I write chapter one and then I write it as it would be, a chapter two and I go, so that's my first draft process. So I would sort of get to sort of 50,000 words with the book in inverted commas complete and obviously it's not, you know, there's so much wrong with it. And at that point, I'd then read it. And I'd, I'd sort of by then have all sorts of other ideas and, you know, and, and you're thinking, oh, no, maybe it should do that and we should do this. And, and then I work with a couple of editors who are wonderful. I've got a really great friend called Anne Hamilton, who's who helped me with my first book. So I actually send it to her and she normally comes back with me. She'll always come up with something. She'll always say, mm, have you thought about this? And that will send me off on a new path. And she's very good at sort of picking up, well, that's fine, but you know, this isn't working here or you need to keep this back to later. So, so she's one of my first readers. My mother is also one of my first readers. I just, I find it useful just the process of giving it to a reader, I think, mm. more. And then once I've done that, then I always go back and read it and think, no, this is all awful. I need to do so much work on this. And it sort of motivates me, I guess. And then I'll do a second draft and that will be much more, you know, filling out that plot and making making the plot. That's very much about plot then, I think. I think first comes characterization, and then I think the plot comes it's sort of fitting those pieces of the puzzle into into what the characters are doing and making sure it all makes sense and there those arcs work then third draft a cup you know past participle actually came together in quite fewer drafts than other things i've written i think that was because i was very clear about what i was doing from the beginning which was really it was quite a joyful experience actually mm. to write it so there weren't big changes? No, there? not massive. I, there were things I added. So I sort of fleshed out some of the male characters like Harris and John. John being Vivian's husband and Harris being one of the doctors she works with. I went back and fleshed them out a bit. I felt they needed a bit more to them. But no, it it was quite... It, it, I, it was strange. It almost sort of just those characters just wanted to be written I always felt which was for me as a writer quite magical like you always sort of dream of that happening and I definitely think that happens in passport happened for me in passport is for and then yeah I think after I then I had a final draft and I ran it by a couple of editors I got a wonderful editor called Claire Strombeck on board and she was just so enthusiastic about it and I think she gave me real confidence because she loved it. And so then another edit after that one, she'd sent me back notes and then it was kind of there. So I would say it was easier, certainly than the first novel I wrote, which, you know, was just as all first novels are rather tortuous. <laughs> and, but this one, I think, it, yeah, it, it sort of not wrote itself, you know it fell into place I think I get you I found the end surprisingly upbeat and positive does that reflect your own feelings about the current state of affairs in Senegal yeah it's interesting because I think it did I mean in the last couple of years Senegal has become a little bit more uh, there's a bit more unrest than there was I mean it was one of the most peaceful and stable countries, certainly in West Africa. 
in the last year there have been quite a few problems political unrest and such like including in Ngor actually so but when I wrote those scenes yes I think I felt I did feel upbeat and I felt upbeat about the prospects for sort of African women and women's rights in Africa and in West Africa in Senegal and and the fact that women are taking control and they're you know there's they've got a voice they're educated they're powerful and they are taking great strides into the future so I think I, d I didn't want to sort of doom laden end and I did feel that I wanted Lily and Vivienne to end up being friends as it were I, th I think I think it would have felt it wouldn't have been right if they'd not had that connection I think they do have a very deep rooted connection by the end because they're linked by the past again I'm trying not to give the plot away mm. <laughs> um, so yeah I love Senegal I didn't want to fall into the cliches and the stereotypes um, of Africa I set out from the beginning when I thought of the idea to write a book that turns those on its head you know I wanted to show a main character who's African an African woman and it's really important in the book I think that the Africa you see the Senegal you see is perhaps not what most people would expect you know and, and that sort of urban life and professional life of Lily so yeah obviously there are lots of political issues and problems as there are in the UK you know but this wasn't a book about that I think I, I think it was about showing that um, this like you know kick-ass Senegalese lawyer can save the day in a way you know so yeah, and she kind of did. Can you tell us a bit about the uh, publishing process with uh, Afsana Press and any activities you've been involved in to promote the book? I know you were in, in, it was long listed in the Bath Novel Award, but perhaps there are some other things as well that you've been doing. Yes, so I feel it was it was kind of meant to be with Afsana Press. So I'd had so many rejections. I'd I'd really got quite demoralised with the whole submissions process to agents. I was sort of in that classic thing that writers have where they're told one thing by one person and one thing by another that's the complete opposite you, if you do this it will be better if you do this it will be better oh and lots I think lots of comments about you know no one's interested in Senegal I was told um no yes really? yes no one oh would be interested goodness. um I was told by one agent that wow. because Senegal wasn't a British colony uh, yeah, she used that language, um, that, that people in the UK wouldn't be interested in this story. Um, perhaps in Germany, <laughs> the whole thing was just ridiculous. And it was after that call and another, um, I just I, I just thought, you know, I'm not doing this anymore because I know this story is good. I know that people would want to read it, you know, you know and so I gave up. And then I was talking to a designer friend and they said, I've been working with this guy, Goran, he's, he's setting up a, up a publisher and he's a really nice guy. Why don't you send it to him? And that was that, was that really. And that I had a meeting with Goran and he was just so delightful and so literary minded. You know, he, he clearly just cared about the literature and cared about stories and cared about getting them out into the world no matter what and against this sort of wave of commercial literature that that is the state of the industry at the moment and I think it yeah it was it was kind of serendipity I guess so it's been a pure joy to work with them so we had we had we had a couple of launch events which were wonderful and I've also had some wonderful support from the Bath Novel Prize, who were just so lovely that we did an interview and they've been very supportive on social media, sort of tweeting about the book and publicising it that way. So that's been wonderful and I've been so grateful for that. And I've, I, I've spoken to a Dorset magazine that was very lovely to do an interview with them. 
and I've been trying to do social media but I'm not pretty good at it (laughs) and it's so time consuming and I find it if I'm honest I find it quite intrusive both in terms of showing myself to the world but also in my head it sort of gets in my head and then I'm thinking about it and particularly if I write something on there then I'm thinking about it and I need to change it and edit it because I love to edit so that applies to anything I post as well and I do find it it sends me into a bit of a turmoil so I I actually find it quite difficult although I do try my best (laughs) Mm. and I think it also puzzles me how to express something which is mainly in one's head so you know all my work essentially goes on in my head and on my computer (laughs) so how how to express that visually you know on Instagram I find that a real puzzle and I mean I if I've got time I quite enjoy it but juggling writing working parenting and Instagramming (laughs) it's really really quite challenging so (laughs) something's got to give something's got to give yeah 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 it's also a bit dangerous. So you can kind of get yourself into a lot of trouble with Twitter, can't yeah, you? It's keep... quite scary. Yeah, mm. I think I I I haven't I have I haven't tweeted very much at all. I have just reposted things on Twitter. I was mm. I was on Twitter years ago, and I deleted my account for that reason. And then I went mm. on again for the book, but I haven't tweeted much because I find it very intimidating. So I find Instagram nicer it's kinder it's more visual kind of more fun you i think you can be much more relaxed on instagram anything goes and almost that's the point it's just being you know if you post a quirky thing and no one likes it it doesn't matter and i quite like that about it when i've got time (laughs) are there any particular characteristics of senegalese culture that have had an influence on your writing yeah, I think I think uh, certainly that sense that Senegal and Africa, firstly, that Africa sort of bundled into this word where it's so many different cultures and countries, and I always want to explode that myth, you know, explode that myth of life in Senegal. I I think there is an image, a certain image that you know, a reader in the UK might have life somewhere like Senegal. And I think I enjoy turning that upside down, as I say, and and, and showing, you know, that life is, you know, it's, it's very urban in Dakar and it's very modern and it's full of music and it's very intellectual often. And yes, yeah, so I think that for me has been the main thing that I've brought to my writing that I've wanted to show that life in Africa is not about poverty and war you know yes like everywhere there there are those elements but there is so very much more you know and and boundless elements that I you know I particularly know Senegal but there are so many other parts of the culture and other countries and you know it's is quite wonderful so I think that for me I felt really strongly about that and just you know Senegal is just was a wonderful place to set a book you know there's so much so many scenes and settings to play with and I really enjoyed that sort of juxtaposition of Dorset and Dakar and um, because that comes from my own life you know that is very much my experience my journey is, has been, you know, and, and, and I know, and I, I, I do find that really interesting that in some ways when you travel, when you displace yourself away from your home country, your home country perhaps will never be the same. You will, you are changed. And I find that really interesting that you, when you go back home, you're different in some way. And so the things that were once familiar perhaps some more unfamiliar and you ask different questions that kind of thing but also just that yeah that sort of sense of dissatisfaction that when you you know when you're in Dakar you miss cheese and when you're in Dorset you miss the sunshine you know very simply (laughs) but so much you know it can be so much deeper than that with other things and 
and I think you know perhaps I I didn't explore that as much in past participle but it's it's certainly a concept that I find very interesting so but yes just a, a great place to set a book I think and and lots of similarities as well I mean I I guess I I've always loved the sea and the beach and that is partly why it's a common thread in both it's narratives. a very common thread which yeah. is it so this is an interesting thing because my surname is Labus. the people of Angor are Libu so which is spelled L-E-B-O-U my surname is spelled L-A-B-O-U-S and and I do think that I was drawn to that place because I have this sort of seafarer history in my family and and Angor is about the sea the people of the sea and it's a re- and I think perhaps that's why I was so strongly connected to it in the first place and certainly I know in everything I write, I'm just drawn to water and the sea and, you know, everything. It, 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 I can't help myself. I seem to just set things near the beach. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so it's just, it, it is always a common thread, I think. Fantastic. And um, so what, what projects are you working on now? Yes, yeah, so um, I've written a thriller, um, which is, it's in its fin- final editing stages. How I'm, exciting. I can't reveal more at the moment, but there might be okay. news in the new year. Oh, right. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, so it's a sort of, I think of it as a, a sort of feminist thriller. And it's about a female journalist in modern times who follows the path of her late mother, who was a, a film star turned spy for British intelligence. So Dolly Fontaine in modern times follows Gloria Fontaine's journey back to her home country and she has to solve a mystery and so that's that's finished that's that sounds great oh you have to come back and talk about that yeah i'd love to i love i love i love dolly and gloria fontaine they they absolutely live to live for me and i i'm quite excited about bringing them to the world actually but yeah that has been it's been quite a tortuous novel to write and edit because it's got quite a complicated plot it's because it's the past linked to the present very in very real terms so so that's one and then I'm writing another now that is set in northern France which is where my family roots and I'm quite excited actually about exploring that side of my identity because for me that's a place I've pretty much grown up there in many ways I I've spent pretty much every summer there since I was born and my grandparents lived there we've We've got a house there that we go to every summer and that it's a very, very beautiful place, a very evocative place for me in so many ways. Lots of history, lots of family history. So, yes, so I'm writing that at the moment. And that, again, is a it's a sort of past crime that comes to the future. And there's a main character who is sort of finding her way through various threads. I'm sort of exploring the concept of memory and unreliable memories and unreliable narrators, obviously, but that sort of sense of is what you remember the truth. I find that quite fascinating. So I'm reading lots of books by... uh, I'm reading The Man Who Thought His Wife Was a Hat by Oliver Sacks and a few other bits. Mm. Yeah, I find it a really fascinating subject, actually. So, Mm. yeah, so I'm enjoying that. Yeah. You find you have to plot things out much more rigorously than yes. maybe you did with. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm still. I'm on that journey. I'm exploring along with the main character at the moment, but I'm getting there. Yeah, yeah. You can get yourself in horrible knots if you don't <laughs> yeah. with, with that style of fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, that sounds that sounds wonderful mm. too. Well, so lovely to meet you, Jane, and thank mm. you so much for uh, talking to us about your novel and Story Radio. And the the novel's out now and yes. it's available at all good bookshops and yes. online. So thank you so much. It's been lovely to meet you and talk about Past Participle. Mm. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. It's really nice. Hello. I'm Jane Labousse and I'm reading from my novel Past Participle. I'm going to read two extracts from each of the main characters. The first is Lily Tunkara and the second is Vivienne Hughes. Lily walks back through the tranquil passageways of the village, where the earth and plaster walls are burnished gold now in the setting sun. 
How to persuade Bakri Bar to talk, if he ever will. No doubt he's scared, but of what, and of whom? And why does the death of a man killed thirty years ago, seemingly unrelated to Bakri, and when he himself was only a teenager, still prey on a grown man's mind? Lily's own mind wanders to Eme, dead now for thirty years. Thirty years! She sees him in the photograph again, broad and handsome, sunlight glinting from his wet skin. How vital he was then, how athletic and alive. Her big brother would have been a man of fifty-four right now, a grown adult who would have already lived a whole life, a job, a wife, a batch of children probably, and a bunch of mistakes, like any normal human being. Instead, Eme Tunkara is in the ground, bones and earth beneath the whispering acacia trees of the village cemetery. The savage thought upsets Lily. She does not want to dwell on the morbid image, but her mind insists. J'aime, j'ai aimé. I love, I loved. Aimé would never, could never, be more than a past participle. Now that was tragic. Doesn't her brother deserve justice, even ad memoriam? There again, maybe she should just let sleeping dogs lie, as the British would say. Aimé is dead, an entire life wasted. But should it really fall to her, the sister, to make up for the wrongdoings of the past? Lily shakes her head with a perplexed expression, turning off down a back alley towards the car. As she does, she glimpses a familiar male figure, at least he looks very familiar, back turned, swerving off with a furtive bearing, like a stray dog, thinks Lily, sloping off with a prized chicken in its jaws. He turns left, into a tapering pathway leading to one of the dwellings on this side of the village. Forgetting Bakri Bar for a second, Lily hesitates, her mind a buzz, then carries on with cautious steps to the opening to the pathway, where she peers tentatively around the corner. How ridiculous to behave like a detective, she thinks, leaning with an awkward bend of her neck and adjusting her focus to the dim shade of the back street, enclosed on both sides by other buildings. Is it? Surely she's imagining. Good God, it can't be. Her heart jumps. She misses a breath, then gasps for air with the next. Her husband, Demba, stands in the doorway, broad shoulders bent frontwards. He wears a smart, European-style shirt and jeans, with his best open leather sandals. Lily can hardly breathe. Dry-mouthed, her heartbeat slows and thumps. From the interior... Another person, a woman, extends bright painted hands, coral if Lily isn't mistaken, and puts her arms around Lily's husband's waist. In a flash, Demba is pulled inside, as if the dog himself has been drawn into the jaws of a hungry crocodile. Now I'm going to read from Vivienne. Viv sips the tea, thinking about the wake that afternoon where old friends swarmed to offer their condolences. So sorry, old thing. Lovely chap. Lovely chap. There were Fuzz and Miles McFlannery, a few others from London and the Embassy days, all the old lot from Senegal. She'd been half expecting Harris to turn up out of the blue, but in the end, to her great relief, he'd stayed away. So she'd smiled dutifully and kissed cheeks, offered smoked salmon blini and cups of tea, trying to achieve the required funereal balance between grieving widow and sociable hostess holding it all together in the face of extreme difficulty. The guests in their dark suits joked and bantered in a way she found aggravating, distasteful, yet when she failed to cry at the sight of John's coffin lowered into the earth, the same individual's disingenuous stares were hot as flames. Now she's alone, thank God, it's over. Viv finishes the tea and turns on her laptop, which pings with an influx of emails. She puts on reading glasses, leaning in with curiosity to read a message near the top of the stack, entitled, Making Contact. She registers the name of the sender, and her heart stutters. Dear Vivienne, she reads, My name is Lily Tunkara, and I'm a lawyer based in Dakar, Senegal. Years ago, my older brother, M.A. Tunkara, was killed in a car accident, I'm keen to talk to you and your husband, John, about what happened that night. I wondered if I could give you a ring on the telephone. Best wishes, Lily Tunkara. Oh, Lord, thinks Viv.
That was Jane Labus reading from her novel, Past Participle. If you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon, Coffee, or donating by PayPal. Thanks for listening, and see you soon.